Welcome. My name is Michael Jordan, as I often joke. Uh, no, not that Michael Jordan. Uh, I'm the uh, I'm I'm a global communications specialist and an executive coach. And um, <clears throat> as I as I said, uh, uh, we will have a few case studies as well over the next hour. Here, let me show you today's agenda. We've had a few introductions. I want to open by explaining why brand building matters. Then a few of my core takeaways for you during this session. Then I want to explain a bit about the, the backstory, about how my journalistic journey, but more importantly, how and why I learned some of these brand building skills and apply them to my own brand building. Then some of the lessons learned, the key lessons learned from my own journalism and how I applied them to the brand building. Then three case studies, starting with myself. I will be the first guinea pig, the first laboratory rat in this situation. Uh, I don't, my, my teaching and coaching style is not just to say, do this and do that, but to also give myself as a real life example. Then, as I mentioned before, we'll have a second case study of Kelly Montanero. We'll focus on how she, as a young professional, uh, can build her brand. And then we'll have a uh, third case study, Catherine Argiro, who introduced herself early on, and to talk about how she's developing her thought leadership. Then, uh, hopefully, we'll be able to squeeze in a few questions of yours. And then lastly, uh, a, a few words uh, to finish off and how you can move forward, how we'll move forward together. By the way, if you do have questions, Emily will be monitoring and curating. Please, whenever questions pop into your mind, go ahead and enter them into the chat and we will try to address as many as possible toward the end of the hour, okay? So let me begin with my, my PowerPoint. Actually, let me share, to, let me switch to the big screen, okay? First of all, you are a brand. I'm a brand, okay? We are all in a sea of, swimming in a sea of brands. We all are a, a product or a service, okay? You may say to yourself, I have a job, a pretty comfortable job on staff somewhere, but tomorrow, sadly, you could be fired. You could be laid off and then you are on your own. So ultimately, we all need the safety net. Even if we have a, a comfortable, a stable job, we all need the safety net of building our own brand, our own platform and where others can find us as professionals. So in this sea of brands, it's important to know that it's not just that we're competing with other brands, but also for us to keep in mind that many people out there, as you know, are lying, are exaggerating, are misinforming, disinforming. They're trying to dupe others. They're trying to trick us, okay? So one thing that we need to do, and again, I'll send this, uh, uh, this video so you don't need to, to take notes. Sometimes I go a little long with my with my slides, but I want to be very clear, okay? That all of us as brands and products have a strong self-interest to say, we're wonderful. We're excellent professionals, hire me. But that would work with, and I'll talk in just a minute about a couple of different audiences. That would work with some audiences. It would not work with other audiences. Our two main challenges, as I've come to appreciate on LinkedIn, for example, but with any of our platforms, our two main challenges are to prove we are who we say we are and that we do what we say we do. Anyone can say, I'm a global communications specialist. I'm a lawyer. I'm a doctor. I'm this, I'm that. Okay. But as we know, again, some people are lying, okay, out there and trying to harm us for some reason. And the second, even more challenging challenge is not just to prove that we are who we say we are, but also that we are as good as we claim to be. Again, because we had that strong self-interest, very few of us would say, if we're uh, approaching an employer or a client, few of us, if any, would say, I'm mediocre, I'm so-so at what I do. No, of course, we're gonna say we're good. The real challenge is to prove that we're as good as, as we are. And once we do that, how can we prove our impact? on others, on clients, on partners, on colleagues? How can we prove our comparative advantage, how we compare favorably 
compared with others in our field? How can we prove our value added? That what value we bring to the table, to the conference room, to a colleague, a partnership, anything like that. How can we prove these things? As I often say, this is actually one of the highest forms of strategic communications. And that's what today's event is about, is really opening up your mind to the, the notion that this is a form of strategic communications. You need a smart, effective strategy for how to build your brand, develop your thought leadership. And of course, I'll tell you more about this. Because why is this such a high level? Because we're actually trying to influence someone's behavior. It's one thing to try to open their mind, maybe to inform and educate or better inform and educate. But now we're, we're actually trying to push the right button to influence their behavior so that they do what? That they achieve our objective, which could be to hire us, could be to invest in us, could be to donate to us. That's a very, very high level of strategic communications. And what I'm going to explain to you, immodestly speaking, is that this unique strategic communications challenge requires a unique solution, the MJ method, which I've named after myself, Michael Jordan, okay? Especially, again, as I say, when you consider who our target audience is, let me explain who I believe our target audience is. We have two, as I've learned throughout my years, we have two potential uh, target audiences. One are sheep-like, with all due respect, because some of these sheep may be our friends, may be our family members, those who will fo follow blindly. They hear that some product is excellent, and so they say, I'm going to buy that product. I'm going to invest in that product. And then maybe later they realize it's not such a good product. Why was I so unthinking, so uncritical thinking, which leads to our second audience, the critical thinkers. Okay. And frankly, in terms of sustainability, it's one thing if, if we're looking to trick people and we're hoping to, to get some business or get their money, and then we're, we're not expecting to go back to them in the future. That's not sustainable for any business, any individual to try to, to hope and believe that you can trick people once and expect to go back to them. No. Instead, in terms of sustainability, we need to prove our value, prove our impact, and we're dealing with, we are approaching now a smart but skeptical audience, okay? They're smart. They are a certain elite audience. They could be employers, clients. They have money in their pocket. They have a position that we want, and they are skeptical. This is such a key word, and even a skill is to reflexively develop that skepticism, which is everyone approaching is going to say they're the best, but we know they're not the best. Let's, let's also think empathetically, think about the employer or potential client. They're being approached by professionals like us, all saying that they're the best, they're skeptical, they're suspicious. So then our challenge is how to lower that, that wall of suspicion and skepticism, how to build a bridge of trust and understanding, okay? And I will try to explain how to do that, okay? So our core takeaways for today's session, okay? I boiled it down to a few. Ultimately, that this is a form of strategic communications. It requires a small, a smart, thought-through strategy where it begins with considering your audience. Who exactly is my audience? For example, employers or clients, why exactly are they my audience? Because they're looking for staffers. They're looking for a product, a service, okay? Then also, what do I want to say about myself? Why that? And even how do I want to say these things about myself? That's the strategic communications that I'll explain. Second, it may sound simple, but empathy is such an important part of this process, okay? It's not just... I'm going to build my brand. I'm going to say this about myself. I'm going to say that about myself. That could be very ineffective. You're just firing off words, content out into the ether. Okay. But what we should do as a first step, again, not just imagine who our target audience is, but imagine if we were in their shoes. Okay. And what are they looking for and why? What kind of partners are they looking for? What kind of employees are they looking for? What kind of products and services? and why, and then if they're going to read our content, learn about us, what would resonate? 
what would not resonate, what would push the right button, what would not push the right button with them, okay? Thinking through all these things. Otherwise, we're firing off content blindly into the darkness. Instead, we want to be able to see our target as clearly as possible in order to be as effective, impactful, persuasive as possible with our content, okay? This leads to my third takeaway. And it's something I've been talking about for years with my journalism students, with my, with my uh, clients, with partners, anyone. The idea of show, don't tell. Don't just tell who we are, show who we are. Don't just tell what we can do, but show what we can do. Don't just say we're excellent or impactful, but let's show them with concrete, as I often say, concrete, specific, credible, meaning believable, verifiable. That's it's somehow transparent that our audience can actually be able to click on something to prove that what we're saying is true evidence-driven content to support whatever we say, okay? Again, number four, they are smart but skeptical. Always important to keep in mind who exactly our target audience is. Then lastly, what I'm aiming to do here today overall is to demystify the process, okay? It's one thing for me to say to you, hey, build your brand. And you might nod your head and say, yeah, I need to build my brand but you may not have any idea how to do it. And today, within you know the next 20, 30 minutes, I hope to demystify, remove the mystery as to how exactly to do this, okay? Now, very quickly, I just want to explain a bit about my journalistic journey, how and why I learned this. Why? Why do I want to share this story? Because credibility is so important throughout this process, believability, as a brand, as a product and service. So I want to share a bit about you. So my journey begins in, in, in Europe, in the heart of Europe, in the tiny Central European nation of Hungary, where I began as this is actually my father's hometown, where I began as a young reporter. This was me many years ago with much more hair back then. You'll see that I was with a photographer colleague and the red shirt was my interpreter. This was me actually reporting in Serbia as a young freelance foreign correspondent, okay? This was my very first article that I ever had published, which was so essential for me to build credibility, especially for those of you, for those of you who are at, at the bottom of the ladder starting out in your career, and saying, I can do this, I can do that, but you've never actually done it before, you need that first big break where you can actually prove you can do it. And in a few minutes, I'm going to explain that sometimes it may mean doing it for free, just to be able to get something published, to be able to create some evidence, some facts on the ground that you can do what you claim you want to do, okay? Or what that you claim that you're capable of doing. This article was published in 1995, a long time ago, but I call it my big break because at the time I wanted to break into uh, international reporting, foreign correspondence. I wrote about the Bosnian War going on at that time, which was winding down. Uh, it got, been going on for three years with 200,000 people killed, 2 million refugees from the former Yugoslavia. I wrote this story about... Uh, uh, mothers, women who had, I should say, women who had been raped and then had abandoned their babies. So this was a story of children born of rape, rape as warfare, which later became a, a, a war crime at the International Criminal Court in The Hague. And this was my first article published in the Miami Herald. And what was so significant about this article was then when I approached future clients I was now able to show a sample of my work. They didn't need to know it was my only sample. I would approach a newspaper and say, oh, and here's a sample of my foreign reporting, my international journalism. Again, they didn't know it was my only one, but I was at the bottom of the ladder and then step by step, I was able to build up. So credibility, okay? Now, here are a couple of key skills that I learned that I want to apply to, to you and your reality. Hold on. I call this, I, I developed a few diagrams because I was very serious minded based in Budapest as a foreign, a freelance foreign correspondent. And I began to learn how the formula works, how exactly I could 
not just generate my own story ideas, but sell those story ideas to foreign editors, to Western editors in the US, in the UK, okay? And then even get to the point where not only would they publish my stories, but pay me for my articles, and then even to send me to these different countries I wanted to explore, paying for my, my flight, my hotel, my interpreter. I needed, I didn't speak all those languages. And even my meals and my interpreter's meals as well. So then I realized, wait a minute, I have a very powerful self-interest. Okay, I drew up this diagram on the left-hand side. To sell my ideas was my self-interest, to sell my stories, to get published, to get paid, to travel for free, to make the boss happy, and then to climb the career ladder as a foreign correspondent. And it wasn't just me, 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 here's what I want. I was thinking through, what does the editor want, okay? And in this case, I was thinking through, hey, they want top quality stories that their own people, that their readers will want to consume, okay? Read, watch, or listen to. They want stories that their own correspondents can't or haven't yet produced. Back then, they also wanted to satisfy the advertisers, of course, okay? But I realized, hey, we have some overlap of self-interest. I want to sell stories, you want to buy stories. And then I came up with this intersection, this Venn diagram of, can I push the right button, okay? And then I realized the only way to push the right button is would be to convince them that my ideas were either interesting to their readers. I was now thinking through, I had two audiences. First of all, my first audience were the editors. The second audience were the readers. So I realized my ideas need to be interesting or important or ideally both, okay? And then once I sell the idea, I need to be able to deliver to prove that I am as good as I claim to be, that then I could deliver what I promise. You know, I, I want to zip, zip ahead because I now realize it flows a little better for me to apply this intersection of self-interest to you. This is not just about me and my journalism, of course. I just wanted to give some context. But now I apply the intersection of self-interest to the challenges that you face, okay? Which is for you to also think through in terms of your own objectives, short-term, long-term, to think through yourself as a brand, as a product and service. What is my product? What is my service? What are my marketable skills, my marketable experience, my goals, my objectives, my interests, my passions, my key selling points, my credible evidence? I'll talk about this in a few minutes. What evidence do I have to prove that I am who I say I am, that I'm as good as I say I am? And then to think through, well, who are they? Who is my target audience? And what do they want? Who's my market, my consumer, my audience? What market research do I do? Do I know them well? what opportunities exist or don't exist, why, why not? This is really, if you want to break in as a freelancer, you're really looking for, for a, an important position to climb that ladder. This is also about the market research and learning who your target audience is, okay? What skill set, experience, expertise do they seek and why? And then, and then as I say, hey, it's one thing for you to say, this is who I am. This is what they're looking for. You can't be stubborn about it, okay? It's now, hey, if they're looking for this and I want a job or I want a client, how can I adapt? How can I tailor my skills, experience, knowledge, background to hit that target? How can I adapt, adjust and adapt my brand to push the right button, how to persuade them to choose me? And then at the bottom of the screen, you see with evidence-based material, okay? Do I have evidence-based content to prove my comparative advantage and value added? Do I have any do I have enough? Do I need more? How to create it? Okay. I'm sure you have questions, but let me get to, okay. I, I think I'll probably need to, to zip through some of this. Okay. Show, don't tell with credible evidence. We already went through that. Here's one more important skill I want to share with you. Also, as a young journalist, as I was climbing the ladder, I developed my own communications strategy. Again, strategic communications. I developed a four-step formula, which I called immodestly back then the Jordan four-step formula. Four steps. We already discussed the first one. Who exactly is my target audience? Again, to be able to visualize clearly whom we're aiming for and why, what they're looking for and why. Why should they care about me 
and my content, what I'm, what I'm approaching them with and what, how I'm selling myself. Next, these three points I haven't yet discussed. What exactly do I want to write? What exactly do I want to say about myself? What point or argument will I make? What idea do I propose? What message will I deliver directly to their heart, to their mind? Okay. What story do I want to tell? By the way, I'm sorry, I should have mentioned with the heart and mind. I realize that with a smart but skeptical audience, okay, and that's who we're ultimately approaching, smart but skeptical. They have a job. They have money, whatever it is, they have something that we want, but they're skeptical, okay? That the only way to persuade, if that skeptical mind is also open-minded for some reason, they're looking for to hire someone, okay? They're looking to partner with someone, so they are open. The only way to positively impact that skeptical mind is with that concrete, credible, verifiable evidence that can touch a skeptical mind. And then the humanized content, humanizing ourselves or humanizing the people we've assisted, we've contributed to, okay, our previous uh, assignments or partnerships or, or employers, that can touch a skeptical heart, okay? So the credible evidence can touch the mind the humanizing content can touch the hearts, okay? So now thinking through, it's not enough to say, I want to say this, I want to write about that, but why exactly, this is the critical thinking on our part, why exactly do I want to make this point or argument? Why exactly present this idea, deliver this message, or to tell this story? Why exactly, now we're thinking empathetically, why exactly would my audience find this point or argument, or idea, message, interesting, or important, or persuasive? Why should they even read this piece of content that I've produced to build my brand? And here's a filter, okay? Here's how you can identify. You may say, Michael, how do I, how do I know what point, argument, idea, message is interesting, important, and persuasive? Here's a filter. Think through empathetically. My audience, whomever your audience is, should find this content interesting, or persuasive, or even valuable, because why? Why exactly? Finish this sentence to make the case for why exactly you should write this, okay? To, to justify why you could write about a hundred different things. Why write about this? Why say this about yourself, okay? And then the fourth step is the how. We have the who, the what, the why, and then the how. How exactly do I want to make this point or argument? How exactly do I want to propose this idea or deliver my message? This is also related to thought leadership and what you're going to say. If you're going to share your thought, your opinion, your analysis, your insights, okay? Then, even, then to think through, okay, how am I going to present this, okay? With which, with which facts, or evidence, or details, or examples, anecdotes, insights, maybe graphs, maybe a map, what kind of data to support whatever you're about to say, okay? Likewise, how exactly do I want to tell this story or create this content, okay? <clears throat> you know what? I just found, just yesterday, I found a post on LinkedIn that reminded me of why empathy is so important, okay? Reading these first two, uh, a, a colleague out there, Caroline Carter-Smith, I've never met her before, but I saw what she wrote online about, about some of the changes that LinkedIn is undergoing right now. And the first two really caught my eye. Moving forward here to suggest regarding posts, moving forward content that's a, that trends toward the evergreen that provides actionable, useful advice, tips, or knowledge like I'm trying to share right now with this, uh, with this webinar will continue to show up in feeds, okay? The last sentence though, so focus on posts that align with your expertise, but that will add value to your target audience. That is empathy. That's thinking through, why would they find this valuable, okay? If I were in their shoes, would I find what I'm saying, what I'm writing valuable? Yes, because, okay? And the second one, prioritizing meaningful comments, okay? As we all know on LinkedIn, it's one thing for someone to post something and for someone to comment, love it, great idea, way to go, well done, okay? But those are 
with all due respect, those are empty words. They don't add much value to the dialogue, to the engagement, the conversation. But look at the, the bottom here. Now the algorithm in LinkedIn looks for comments, adding knowledge and offering insight. To whom does it add knowledge or offer insights? To the audience. Again, empathizing with the audience. If I say this, then anyone reading this comment will also, this moves the ball forward, moves the, the, the conversation forward in an interesting new direction, something they haven't thought about before. That's what I mean, adding value to the conversation, okay? And I, I wanted to quickly even show you how I apply my four-step method even to this webinar. I, I didn't just say, here's what I wanna talk about for an hour of the webinar. I thought through, who is my target audience and why? I imagine that you out there, the 233 people who signed up for this event are across the professional spectrum, all different ages, all different parts of, of the world, all different stages of their career, okay? Why are you tuning in? Each of you presumably has a self-interest as to why you're interested in building your brand or developing your thought leadership. OK, maybe you're driven by your own ambition, maybe by desperation, looking for some, maybe some other motive. But to tune in to a free webinar, I, I can imagine at least let me get one or two or three valuable tips that I can even maybe apply right away. Who knows? I'll take a chance by listening to this guy. In that case, I'm thinking through I better deliver value within this one hour. OK, so then I thought through what do I want to say. What are my core messages? That's how I came through came up with, all right, I want to emphasize strategic communications and empathy and show, don't tell. But why say that? Again, because I'm assuming you guys are an elite audience. You're smart, but you're skeptical. This may be free, but you're still expecting some value. You may not know me personally, so I have to work pretty hard, intellectually speaking, to, to impress upon you why these things are important. That's why I even explained some of my own background to build up some of the credibility of what I'm saying and will say now moving forward, okay? So I wanted to deliver some tangible takeaways for you to apply as soon as possible, even today or tomorrow, and also to be clear enough and pack it with value. And then lastly, I thought through how exactly do I want to say it? Hopefully I'm explaining as clearly as possible my various skills and strategies and will continue to do so. But I also want to show, not just tell, by illustrating and illuminating with concrete examples. That's why I'll soon mention myself as an example, Kelly and Kathleen, okay? Now, on my platform, you'll find a six-step strategy. But I want to boil it down. Now I really need to, to move forward quickly. Let's see. Ooh, we're running out of time. Okay. Bottom line is, here's how you should begin. Okay. By identifying your own short-term, long-term goals. I've already suggested that you think through who and what your brand is, what your product and service is, what the appetite and demand is. Again, it's supply and demand. It's market econ economics going on out there. <clears throat> and so for you to think through short term, long term, then for you to identify. When you think through your short term, long term, again, empathy. So then who out there is looking for someone like me? What exactly are they looking for? And why? What qualities? What kind of skills are they looking for? What kind of knowledge, experience, expertise would they want from a brand or a product or service like me, a professional like me. Then to match up, simply put, to identify what do I have? What can I show already based on my experience as evidence-driven, credible content, okay? I may have some, some content, but how persuasive is it? Does it need to be improved? Then on the other hand, there's what's missing, what's lacking. Hey, they're looking for this. They're looking for that. I have gaps. Let me think through. Let me look for opportunities. How to fill those gaps. It's one thing if you can already fill gaps from referring to your past and drawing out some, some experiences from your past and putting them in print on LinkedIn as, as content. It's another thing to say, okay, moving forward, I need to, as you see with number six, moving forward, I need to seek out those opportunities 
in which I can to create these facts on the ground. If it's a short term objective, if it's a long term objective, how am I going to get there if I've never done something before? But I have hopes, I have dreams of going in this and that direction. Let me try to build up and look for those opportunities where I can create content, evidence driven to prove I can do what I want to do, what I claim to be able to aspire to do. OK, again, I already talked about this. I've identified four different uh, forms of content you can create to build your brand, okay? Some of it is essential proof, documents to, to no, document as a verb, to, to document, to chronicle that you are and do what, you, what we say we do, okay? But often, as I now say, not just written content, okay, but a photo, somehow to get a photo too, because you know the impact, you know the way your own eyes are drawn to photos more than gray text, they're drawn to videos, okay? Video, photos and videos, but photos especially can also be evidence, it's a form of, of evidence, okay? So if you say, hey, I'm gonna do an assignment, or I have a gig coming up, I have something that I'm going to do even as a volunteer, I want to document that I did this. I want to chronicle that. Then the origin story. I call this an, an origin story because if you are, for example, uh, at where you are today, if you want to explain the how and why you got to where you are, if you're looking to shift careers, to, to blaze a new trail, OK, and you need to explain, well, wait a minute, your background is in journalism. Why are you now looking for communications? You may need to explain that shift. OK, but the reason why the origin story is important, OK, to write down all the relevant background of your story, of your backstory, is because when you send off a cover letter or uh, a proposal, and if I say, for example, uh, during my 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 career as a journalist, okay, my career as a, I will hyperlink, I'll insert a hyperlink under my career as a journalist. And if anyone wants to read that, if anyone needs evidence or proof that they're reading my cover letter, to read my proposal, and it's oh his background as an international journalist, they click on that, it clicks to my LinkedIn origin story or my website's origin story, and then they can learn about my whole backstory. So I see this as a foundational piece of content for you, which is I need to explain the how and why, where I came from and why my journey up to the present time. Okay, so it chronicles, as I said, where your journey begins, how exactly it evolved or changed over time up to today. Then your impact story, evidence-driven content to prove your positive impact that you are as good as you claim to be. I did this at this employer. Were you any good at it? You can write about your positive impact. Or I did X, Y, Z with this client. Did you do it well? I'm a skeptical audience. And then you can prove with an impact story. I'll explain a bit about what an impact story is and how to create one. And then thought leadership. It's very important as a showcase for your, as I write here, your thoughts, ideas, opinions, analysis, insights, experience, commentary, okay? And uh, as, as I'll sh soon show with, with, uh, uh, with Kathleen, that there are many ways to do this, okay? That you could find an article that you read and, hey, this is relevant. I want to say something about this because this is relevant to my short-term objective, to my long-term objective, to show that I have serious experience in this field. I have serious analysis, insights, ideas. Okay, so it could be an ar uh, uh, an article you read, could be a report, could be a news event, could be a current trend. There are many opportunities to write about something and then to share your thought leadership, to establish yourself as someone who should be listened to, who has something fresh and interesting to say, okay? Now, <clears throat> this today is not a writing workshop, okay? I will be organizing a writing workshop, okay, in which you are welcome to join. That will not be free because that's much more time consuming, okay? And I'll talk about that uh, at the end. So I can only briefly explain and or and you, you can rewatch the, the 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 video to from this webinar that this is how I create an impact story. I have a structure. 
I have a methodology for how to create an impact story. Uh, simply put, by the way, an impact story is here's what the situation was before I arrived or before I got involved. And then I was able to do X, Y, Z. And now here's the situation once I left or once I completed a project to show the before and after then can be evidence of your impact. Okay. The backstory, these are actually chapters that I've written that are on my LinkedIn platform. I wrote about how to describe the backstory of any issue or situation, but also of any individual, how you can bring to life, not your whole story. I was born in the year on a cold and rainy night in the village of no, no, no. Your relevant backstory, okay? Relevant to your brand, your product, your skill, your objectives, that sort of thing. Where your story begins, why there, and how your story evolved and why it evolved and changed the way it did, okay? And then I have a chapter on how to write these things. Again, we'll have a, a organizer writing workshop later, okay? Let me check the, the time. Oh, Here's something very important. Would you ever write or work for free? Okay. This is very important because if you look at almost all my content that I've created on my LinkedIn platform, all my brand building content, I did for free. It was time consuming. Okay. Many years ago, this was one of my first pieces I did as uh, for, for free. This was for Harvard University has a media magazine. And at the time, as I was now living in, in Slovakia and I was doing trainings in Prague, in the Czech Republic, now Czechia, it's known as, and I was developing my own methodology, my own intellectual property for how to teach international journalism. And I wanted a serious platform. I found Harvard's Neiman Reports. I pitched my idea. The editor liked it. And I thought at the end of the conversation, and by the way, how much will you pay for such a thing? And I'll never forget what she said. She said, well, Michael, we believe that the prestige of being published in our magazine is payment enough. And I thought, you're right. I'll do it for free because there I was looking to publish my methodology, get my name published. And guess what? Anyone reading that article, no one knew that I'd done it for free, okay? It did offer prestige and platform. And that's what I often describe as, I even wrote an article several years ago in which I talked about the benefits of sometimes working for free or writing for free. Some people call it slave labor. I call it, uh, uh, no, if it serves your purposes. I also do two birds with one stone. I like the idea of <clears throat> whenever I take on any assignment, and I would encourage that for you too, that there'll be some other benefit is not only will I be paid or not only will I be helping someone or, or some community, some client, but I will also use this opportunity to build my own brand, okay? That means calculating, thinking through, Two birds and one stone. I receive one benefit. Let me think through what my second benefit might, might be. I would encourage you to document every experience of value moving forward. Again, if it aligns with your short-term and long-term objectives to post things. Look, very quickly. Long ago, I created my first website to build my brand. This is while I was living in, in Central Europe, then in Southern Africa, in the tiny African kingdom of Lesotho. This is my website today building up my my brand and developing my thought leadership you can even see that one of my categories is thought leadership wherever i've been whatever i've done now this was in beijing while i was living in beijing hey if i want to talk about how uh, or to show future clients how i'm a visiting professor of international journalism photographic evidence which i also wrote about or that i'm working at chinese state television for my one unique year working within chinese media I showed myself uh, as news editor working with this host. And so I took a selfie and wrote about my experience, okay? I was also, at, back then I was advising Chinese students applying to American universities on their essays, how to write persuasive essays. And so I wrote for an article about that. These are my two sons in the middle about my own experience with my kids and how I helped them write their essays. This was written for free for Beijing Magazine. Everything I do nowadays, I'm going to zip forward, okay, that this is, I'm even on now a Chinese platform. 
Uh, recently, I needed to prove that I'm doing media relations. So representing a Chinese client at a major tech conference in Las Vegas, I wrote about that. Okay. I've now thought leadership. I have a position, a unique stance on China's global communications challenge. That's why I call it. So I needed to write about it. Okay. Back during in the early days of COVID, I even wrote uh, my thought leadership on why I thought China should apologize for COVID. That's back when many fingers were pointed at, even many Chinese themselves were admitting that, that <clears throat> we are likely responsible for this outbreak in Wuhan. More recently, when I was in Vegas and I had this revelation about uh, why global-minded companies need global communications, I wrote about it to establish, help establish and build my own thought leadership, okay? Then the biggest thing I've done is my own uh, newsletter where uh, ultimately I will be publishing, self-publishing this as a book. As you see, 4,700 subscribers plus, that is me building my thought leadership. All this done for free. Are you prepared to do that, okay? And now I have these platforms. Now, Kelly, we now have Kelly... Uh, if you turn on your camera, Kelly. Kelly, I I hired Kelly um, a month ago. This is her link, um, LinkedIn platform, okay? She is a social media specialist. This is her website, Socials by Kelly Elizabeth, okay? Now, Kelly, if you would please briefly explain um, what you're looking for, what your short-term and long-term goals are, please. Of course. So um, I'm a social media manager. I have had nine years of experience working both in um, house and also for clients. Um, I did just start up my website recently. Um, so short term, I want to get more of my marketing up since that's more the direction that I want to head into with freelancing and having clients um, and more shorter term goals of reaching out and growing my client base. And Longer term, I'd love to be able to build a team um, at Socials by Kelly Elizabeth and have a whole marketing team behind me to help with clients. Um, and then I'd also love to um, help offer courses and workshops to other social media marketers and managers looking to go on their own um, entrepreneurial journey. Sounds great. Now, just so, to let you know, some of you in the audience may be able to relate to Kelly because she's also 25. So now she is not at the bottom because of the ladder, but now the first, second, third rung of her career with both short term and long term goals. And yesterday, Kelly, Kelly and I had talked and I was talking about how she could prove her impact because she has had a very uh, a dramatic impact on helping build up my platforms. Do you recall what we discussed yesterday in terms of building up platforms? Yes. How to prove your impact. <laughs> yes, we talked about um, taking screenshots, doing a lot of documenting, um, which is extremely helpful because I know in the beginning of my own career, that was not something that you know I was focusing on especially I was talking to Michael about, I had done email campaigns um, earlier on and they were really amazing, but obviously they're still with the clients. I don't have those analytics at this point, a couple of years later. Um, so we were discussing that of, you know, how to prove my work that I had done in the past, but I don't have those screenshots with me. So a couple of things, please. First of all, I'm showing this screen. This is the classic before and after approach that I mentioned before, okay? This is my Instagram, okay? Before I had, if you look at the, the image on the left, I had barely any Instagram presence. What I'd done was I'd shot screenshots of all the chapters I published so far from my newsletter, and pasted it up there. I had no real followers, no real engagement. I just thought, all right, uh, just some evidence if someone finds me, I need to build that up one day. And then Kelly came along starting last month. And now the image on the right is what my Instagram page looks like today, okay? That she actually built up a presence. She now has effectively brought me to life with some videos, some of the the, the content that I've generated, there's now been some engagement as she reaches out. So Kelly, just to be clear, for those of you watching, 
when she looks for more clients, she ought to, first of all, she should uh, produce a LinkedIn post and for her website as a case study. For the MJ Method Communications, they had zero in terms of their Instagram before. Here's what it looked like photographic evidence. And then I did X, Y, Z. And here's what it looks like today. Screenshot photographic evidence, okay, to prove my impact the before and after. And then if I'm a skeptical employer saying, you know what, can you do for me like what you did for the MJ Method Communications? There you go. You, you write about it, you create a link, and then you can include it as, and here are samples of my work, of my impact on clients, okay? Now, regarding Kelly's um, email campaign, okay? I said two possibilities. First of all, if she still has a, a decent relationship with the previous employer, you could say, hey, dear colleague, dear client, um, I'm now in the process of building my brand and I would like to be able to talk about how I was able to, to help create or to lead whatever it was to be factually accurate regarding that email campaign. Let's see if they go along with it. And then you say, and, and I will tag your company in my, in my post. So they get a little bit of maybe additional traffic, but all you're doing, you're asking for a favor, but all you're doing is to plant your flag to prove that, that this does not create anonymity to prove beyond your CV. You already have this on your CV that you did this, an email campaign, but now to produce more persuasive content to build your brand to show not just tell on a cv but to show how and what you did okay or the second possibility i mentioned is moving forward and this is where the free working for free comes into play kelly may have a friend or a colleague or a client she may hear of an opportunity she may offer to a client hey i can help you with an email campaign OK, and they say, oh, we don't have the budget for that or, we, you know, we already have staff. We we can't hire anyone else. You could say, I will do this for free. Why? And you can explain, I'll do this for free, but I would like to then write about it as a case study, as an impact to show what I was able to do for you. And you know what? Sometimes people who are looking for free help may say, OK, it's a win win. Let's do it. OK, so moving forward, she could look for an opportunity because she has short term, long term goals. And if you write about that email campaign again, no one needs to know that you did it for free moving forward. OK, they will assume that you didn't do it for free, that you were paid. But you're thinking strategically, calculatingly, I needed to do it. I needed to create facts on the ground. I needed some compelling evidence. OK, because it's ultimately going to take me where I want to go for paying clients and better paying clients as you climb the ladder, okay? Thank you, Kelly, for that. I'm sorry that, that we didn't have more time to spend with you. I'd like to move on to Kathleen Argiro. Kathleen, please. Hi. Hello, Hi, Kathleen. Hi. Just very quickly, I want to show. So this is, I, I met Kathleen uh, about uh, six months ago or so. She's a fashion designer and a professor at Fashion Institute of Technology here in New York. And it just so happened that when I met her that she was looking to expand. Well, you can tell us more, but I just want to show here's also your website, Kathleen Argiro, New York. OK, so Kath, Kathleen, go ahead and, and uh, explain a bit about your background and what your short term, long term goals are. Yeah, so um, so I'm a fashion designer and I've sold to major stores around the world, uh, Saks, Neiman's, Bloomingdale's, and then I segued into teaching at the Fashion Institute of Technology, but also doing consulting, consulting for emerging brands. But then I actually went back to get my master's degree and focused on emerging technology. So Web3 technologies, AI, generative AI, et cetera. And so I wanted to build my consulting business in that area because I have a foot in traditional fashion and in the future of fashion. So when I met Michael, um, he gave me this amazing roadmap, beginning with my origin story, um, to begin to try to um, do a pivot at my stage of my career. So, you know, giving me tips and tricks about what I needed to do in terms of the impactful stories, making sure that there was actually proof, evidence, um, both photographic, writing stories. Um, so he sort of demystified the whole process. 
So he's been extremely helpful editing my origin story and then kind of keeping me on task as I move forward through this process. Now, thank you, Catherine. Now, now, just to be clear, Catherine also wants, as in building up her own consultancy, to develop, to you want to develop your thought leadership. And we've discussed how you could potentially do this. I want to share the, the screen, for example, okay? That's, here is your platform, and you recently organized an event on AI, and the yes. role that AI is playing in fashion. And you told me yesterday about, about your students' reaction, for example. Go yes. ahead. And that they're terrified it's going to take their jobs, yes. So, so, so imagine that. So then she sees that the younger generation or maybe in general the industry is worried about, hey, maybe AI is going to be uh, um, hijacking the entire profession, maybe driving us out of business as, as humans actually create fa uh, designing new fashion, right? And Kathleen yes. has some ideas, some opinions about this, some analysis, okay? Which is what? Which is basically that it's a tool. It's it's a tool just like when it's basically, it's, it's going to be a, you know, it, it's going to be a ground, it's a groundbreaking tool sort of like when we went from horse and wagon to the automobile. So there were resistors who thought the automobile was, you know, the demon and terrible and, you know, everyone was going to lose their jobs. Well, it's really a tool just to augment and make your life easier and be more efficient. So it's, there's no reason to be afraid of it. You have to embrace it, learn about it, and then integrate it into your workflow. Now, here's why I suggested, okay, as you see, Kathleen is on the front lines of fashion design and emerging technology, okay? But how to prove that she's on the front lines, okay? So she is now documenting more effectively, more persuasively different activities she's involved with. On the other hand, thought leadership, right? So she just gave her opinion that, hey, don't be afraid, students or younger generation, AI is a tool. Okay, so I said, there you go. You should write about this as an opinion piece. The first or a, yeah, as, as a commentary, your first line could be, don't worry, students, AI will not steal your jobs. It's a tool, let's say. And then she explains. Okay. And what I suggested for those of you keen to develop your thought leadership, I said, Catherine, if you were to develop a, a discipline once a month, you say, I, I'm going to write, I'm going to post a piece with my thoughts, opinions, analysis, commentary, okay? Once a month, two, three, four, 500 words on some timely issue, an article, a report, a news event, something that you yourself are involved with, okay? Once a month, after one year, you have 10 or 12 pieces, of your thought leadership. Then in your cover, when you send off a cover letter proposals and you're pitching yourself to clients, you can say, for samples of my thought leadership, click here, here, here. Give the three you're most proud of. But after two years, if you have 20, 24 pieces, you're publishing once a month, you could almost self-publish a book on my thought leadership. That's what I'm doing with my newsletter Okay, I'm up to chapter 19. It's the same thing. If you're posting serious articles or posts, three, four, five hundred words, you can then collect those and even self-publish as a book. Imagine what that does to your credibility and your thought leadership. That now it's Catherine Argiro, fashion designer, professor, and author of and the name of your book. Potentially. Okay, that's down the road. Right. That's what I'm aiming for. Absolutely. Okay? So um everyone. We, we should really wrap up. We're, we're past 11 o'clock, okay? Again, I want to, to summarize with this idea of the need to, to think through a communication strategy, the need to empathize with your audience in terms of the content you're creating and will it resonate? Will it push the right button or not? Show, don't tell with concrete, credible, verifiable proof, okay? And... Um, Oh, I should show my, my last little screen. That moving forward, oopa. Moving forward, okay? I would encourage each of you to try to apply these things to your own reality, please. And, and let me know how it's working out. 
Now, speaking of which, if you want me to assist you, to coach you through creating this content, to give you feedback, you can contact me directly for a one-hour consultation. I even have a curriculum for one-on-one -on -one private individual coaching, 10, 12 hours. I can help you create your first piece of thought leadership, your origin story, your impact stories, okay? Or in the next two, three weeks, um, Emily, Kelly, and I will be organizing a writing workshop for five to 10 of you. Again, that will not be free as this webinar is. Uh, because why not? Because for that writing workshop, which will be four sessions, I will be not just reading your content. I will provide two written critiques, two oral critiques, which is time consuming. But I will lead you by the hand, step by step through the entire process until your first piece is po polished and ready to publish, okay? So thank you all very much for, for attending and, and feel free to, to reach out to me if I can assist you in any way, okay? Thank you very much and happy brand building.